Hi there, and welcome to this quick talk on recreation and regional development. My name is Kyle Rich, and I'm an assistant professor at Brock University in the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies. You've got my email there, so if you have any questions or you want to follow up the conversations that we're having here today, please feel free to reach out and let me know. I'd love to chat more with you in the future. So a quick outline of what we're going to cover today. I'm going to give you a quick introduction to myself and how I find, found myself working in this space. Um, I'll give you an overview kind of of my research program, what I'm working on, and I'll situate this all within these ideas of recreation, planning, and community development. And then I'll take you through a case study um, and talk a little bit about the implications uh, that we can learn from that case study um, when we're talking about recreation and regional development. So as I said before, I'm currently an assistant professor at Brock University in the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies. And my background it really comes from the health sciences. So I did my undergrad at the University of Ottawa in human kinetics. Um, and then I followed up my master's there as well. Um, in that kind of early research, I was looking at um, sport and recreation programs and the way that they can be managed to support um, different types of diversity within these programs. And then I followed that up with my PhD at Western University in the School of Kinesiology. Um, and that's where I really kind of shifted my focus um, and started looking at rural communities and the way that sport and recreation um, is managed and, and played out in rural areas. So my research program now, um, I'm really concerned with the social, cultural, and political aspects of sport and recreation, particularly in these rural and regional areas. So these areas have all kinds of um, really interesting things going on that are um, reflective of their social circumstances, but community members are also using sport and recreation um, in ways that are transformative as well. And what I found through the, through the research process is that a lot of these um, sport and recreation um, research or these theories that are coming out um, often they're decontextualized or don't take into account the way that the community shapes the process and outcome of these sport and recreation programs. So that's really, really how I got interested into this. So as I said, I'm interested in both the outcomes and the processes by which sport and recreation are managed um, or decisions are made. And what this means is having to consider what policy and decision making looks like at the local level as well as the regional level and the provincial and national levels as well. Because when we're talking about um, sport, for example, there are many kind of layers to that discussion that we need to have. And really, I approach these um, from kind of a social justice perspective. So trying to understand um, diverse perspectives and the way that certain groups may be privileged or marginalized through these processes and ways that we can rethink um, the processes of managing and making these decisions in order to be more equitable or fair for, for diverse groups in our communities. So to start off, uh, we have to kind of establish why recreation, right? Why, why is sport and recreation important? Often it might get brushed to the side as something fun that we do on the side or something that's not so integral to um, our planning processes or to our communities. But Recreation and leisure play a really important role in community life. Um, and as I said before, not only in reflecting certain social circumstances, but also in transforming them in different ways. When we talk about municipal recreation, we're often referring to the kind of public institution. So the um, taxpayer funded, organized recreational facilities and programs that exist in most municipalities. And when we talk about community recreation in that way, that practice is really firmly rooted in processes of community development. So identifying the needs of community members and then building programs and services around those needs, around the things that the community has identified as their needs um, and desires. But I think when we talk about recreation, we need to think a little bit more broadly about that because it also encompasses things like um, tourism development that may be very structured and have very different kind of outcomes related to economic development. 
it often invokes uh, ideas of the spaces and places in that are in our communities. So things like a national park, which may be completely outside of the um, community's control, but still plays an important role in that community, whether it's around tourism and economic development, or just around the way people spend their spare time and the things they like to do, the types of people who are attracted to that municipality because of the spaces and places that are around them. And it can also be a rather complex discussion because we're not talking solely about the public, private, or nonprofit sectors. And often organizations from all of these sectors um, will be at play at the same time. So if we take a local soccer academy, for example, this could very likely be a private organization, so a for-profit organization run by an individual, but their training and accreditation is through the nonprofit organization, so the provincial or national sport organization, and they may rent public facilities in order to run this programming and operate it in that way. So the kind of policies and decisions that shape recreation at the community level um, come from a lot of different places and sometimes need a lot of different perspectives to understand really well. But to kind of take a step back, um, theoretically when we talk about recreation, um, it's important to understand the broader context of leisure um, and why understanding leisure is important. Um, so in many planning processes, leisure is kind of fundamental um, and whether we, we think about it explicitly or not, it's something important to consider. So whether we're talking about leisure spaces, so planning things like parks um, or benches where people can rest, um, or we're talking about more kind of fundamental physical things like sidewalks, um, these are all implicated in some way in our leisure activities. So the things we do in our spare time um, when we're moving through the world and maybe enjoying ourselves in a different way. So leisure is in a lot of ways complementary to, but equally as important as work and economics. And the way we plan leisure can have significant impacts on the people that live in the spaces they live in. The kind of struggle though that comes up when we're talking about recreation planning or planning for municipal recreation is that these leisure practices are, are often fluid and changing and evolving with people. So we all may or may not remember the phase of planking when planking was a thing. If you don't remember what planking was, you should pause this, pause this video now and Google planking so you can see what it looks like. But no one was, was planning for planking to happen. This is something that just emerged. It became a thing. In our highly um, connected and digitally mediated world, these leisure practices are flowing and changing faster than we could have ever predicted them to be. So when community recreation has a strong kind of foundation in community development, what it means is that it's changing a lot and it's really difficult to plan for the future when people's recreation and leisure practices are changing so quickly that we don't know where that's going to be. There's also this kind of one of the new and interesting trends that's happening is this reanimation of public spaces. So I'm um, using leisure to kind of reclaim public spaces in different ways. So I have this photo here of these park in sessions where people roll out sod and take over parking spots um, as, a, as a park in, in different ways. And there are many, many examples of how these public spaces that weren't planned for leisure are being reclaimed and reused for leisure in different ways. So these, these trends are, are really kind of emerging and coming from reacting from different things in different ways. One kind of important example to consider um, where sport and recreation really is invoked in kind of a long-term future planning way um, is around events and festivals. Um, so whether it's an individual municipality or a larger region, sport events have become, and, and festivals, different types of festivals, have become one way that plans get made and plans get carried out, or a way to kind of leverage investment from different actors in order to get physical infrastructure that you were hoping for, um, or maybe had planned in the long term, but now have access to resources to make it a short term um, outcome. So for example, the Pan Am Games that happened in Toronto in 2015 
um, were hosted all over the region um, and were a great example of the way that regional planning around sport and recreation um, can get a lot of have a lot of kind of big and important outcomes. There's a lot of interesting research being done, so if you're interested in that, I've linked a few here. Um, but there, the one of the interesting findings is that often smaller events, so second tier events like the Pan Ams or the Commonwealth Games, or even a national championship, um, is often a better bang for your buck in terms of investment because it doesn't come with the huge bill that a large event like the Olympic Games would, but you can still leverage it to get some of those outcomes for your community. So now I want to kind of shift gears and I got, I got big and broad there. I want to bring it back down and, and get a little more specific now um, and talk more about this idea of recreation planning at the community level. So historically, the kind of way we see recreation planned and provided at the community level was really grounded in these social liberal values. So after World War II, um, we had the baby boomers. We had everyone very much concerned with ideas of the public good, taking care of their neighbors, the greater good of the community, um, all these really, um, really great ideas. Um, and then we had, of course, the baby boomers. So there was lots of kids and there was these big investments in infrastructure, a lot of which was recreational infrastructure. So the building of baseball fields, the building of community centers, um, the putting up of arenas and public pools. Um, and there's there a lot of big investments in public recreation at this time period. And then the baby boomers got older and we had fewer and fewer younger people. Um, but the these older generations still have really fond and important memories of these sport and recreation spaces. So the place, it has an important place value for these people. So they live for the stanky smell of that small town hockey arena where they spent many winters in their childhood. Or they want the same play structures and public parks in place for their kids as they had um, as a way to share that place and communicate that nostalgic feeling. Um, and what this does is it leads to a bit of uh, a, a tension where we have aging infrastructure in a lot of places or infrastructure that isn't used in the same way or a population that can't necessarily support that infrastructure, but we have really strong feelings about the infrastructure and a desire to keep it and preserve it in different ways. Now, this isn't necessarily good or bad. I think it's a rather complex process. Um, and I've done some other work on this that I've referenced at the bottom that you can check out if you'd like to. But what's important to recognize is just the kind of changing social context um, and the, the changing ways we're thinking about community recreation. In many cases now, we've moved towards cost recovery models where recreation is no longer a public good that can be fully funded by taxpayers. Um, and rather we're looking to recover the money and to charge for these programs. Um, and that leads to, you know, even, even fewer people often using these um, infrastructure in, in different ways. And then when we talk about rural areas, they're often faced with some additionally kind of complex factors. I tried to sum it up here by, by calling them these difficult paradoxes. So a lot of communities have an abundance of natural resources, so space for leisure activities, particularly outdoor space, but often there's very little capacity to manage it. So whether that's the um, power to, you know, groom trails and keep trails clean, or to manage a little bit of infrastructure in an outdoor space, or um, keep a park up and running um, and safe for different people. So while there are these big spaces and lots of opportunities, they may not be capitalized on in the way that they could be. Um, a lot of smaller communities have abundance of facilities. So, um, you know, the baby boomer infrastructure that was built, or maybe facilities that were combined during amalgamations. Um, in some cases, you're looking at municipalities that have up to four times the per capita number of arenas or baseball fields. And then to kind of compound that, you have aging populations or young people who are moving out and not moving back. And these older populations aren't using these sports facilities the same way that a younger generation would. 
Often these rural areas or regions will also have really good infrastructure in place for regional planning and regional development. So regional economic development plans or perhaps tourism plans that they work on in the region. But then when we talk about recreation, sometimes there are these intense rivalries based on 1988 Junior B hockey fights that nobody even really remembers anymore, but they remember that we don't get along and we can't share an arena. And then for any of you who have spent time um, in rural places or playing sports in rural places, there's also a kind of work hard, play hard attitude in a lot of places um, where a lot of economies are seasonal or resource based. So people learn to work hard and to take the work when it's good and to do the work when you need to. And then what accompanies that is often a play hard mentality where um, your leisure time is hard leisure time or time where you spend a lot of time out making the best of it and needing two or three days to recover. Um, and these, are, these can be really important activities for um, the kind of social fabric of these places. Um, but it's also just an important thing to consider when we're talking about leisure and recreation um, and the way they're engaged um, is understanding those kind of social practices around these places. So next, I want to take you through a case study um, of a project that I worked on. Uh, and this is the Trout Creek Community Center. Um, you can see it there um, labeled on the front of the building. Um, and so this community center is in the municipality of Powassan. It's located about three hours north of Toronto. The infrastructure that you see there, the back piece is where the arena is or the ice pad is. And that at one time um, was an agricultural hall owned by the Agriculture Society. And then that was donated to the town of Trout Creek and the additional hall was added onto it. Um, and the kind of facility that's currently there came to be. Beside it, there's a baseball field and a small park, as well as a, a ring where you can show horses where they host the, the fall fair every year. And this community center became a, a really important piece in the community uh, during a time of change. So I believe um, you've, been, you've been directed to the book chapter that you can get more details from out of this, but I'm just going to kind of tell you the broad story of the Trout Creek Community Center and how it became um, really important in the kind of contemporary social context. So the municipality of Powassan, as I said, is located about three hours north of Toronto, and there's currently at a population of about 3,200 people. There's a history of farming, logging, and tourism, like much of central Ontario. Um, so a lot of 100-acre farms. There was a series of mills, um, as it's not far from the edge of Algonquin Park, where a lot of logging took place. Um, and if you're familiar with Canadian history, Powassan is not far away from Corbeil or Calendar, Ontario, where the Dion Quintuplets were born. If you're not familiar with the Quintuplet story, that's another lecture in itself, but you should look this up. It's a very interesting um, and kind of contentious part of Canadian history. But the quintuplets brought a lot of tourism to the area um, during the Great Depression, when there was very few people moving um, or spending dispensable income in that way. There was thousands of people who were coming up the highway and coming through Powassan. You can speak to local business people who say that their business really took off during the time of the quintuplets because so many people were passing through. Um, they really gave a boost to the local economy. In 2001, along with many, many municipalities in Ontario, the municipality of Powassan, the former municipality of Powassan, was kind of forcibly amalgamated by the provincial government with the neighboring town of Trout Creek and the surrounding township of South Hemsworth. And the municipality currently could be described as a bedroom or commuter community. So located about 30 minutes outside of the um, city of North Bay. It's close enough that people can live in the smaller center uh, with all the immediate amenities that they need and then commute into work in North Bay if need be. So in the last census, although North Bay reported the decline in um, growth, Powassan actually reported a 3% growth since 2011. Now Trout Creek, as I said, was the smaller center that was uh, amalgamated. So Prior to amalgamation, there was roughly 600 people 
in the town of Short Creek. Um, and that, as I said, that amalgamation was um, rather forcibly imposed on the, on the community as it was in many parts of Ontario. Um, and amalgamation was only one part of the changes that were taking place in Trow Creek right around that time. So first in 2000, the school that was operating in Trow Creek was closed down by the school board. Um, if you're familiar with the literature on this, um, there, or even just this experience, a school closure can be kind of a devastating thing for a small community because no longer is it the loss of a place where people have some really important um, feelings and meaning they've, they've ascribed to. It also represents this kind of um, idea that in the future it will be even more difficult to attract young people to the town because there's nowhere for people to go to school. So it's kind of this like double-sided loss that's really, really important. Then in 2001, as I said, there was this um, forced amalgamation, uh, which pulled Trout Creek into the larger municipality. Um, and there are obvious concerns there about uh, representation and policymaking um, and what that would mean when um, decision making was taken out of the smaller center. And then in 2002, Highway 11 um, was put into four lanes all the way north. And this led to the bypass of the highway. So rather than the highway going directly through town, it went around town. And that led to the closing of a lot of the kind of amenities that were there. So the gas station, the local restaurant, the hotels, which moved to kind of seasonal operation instead of steady going. Um, there's a really kind of interesting, funny quote um, from the book chapter where the joke, running joke in town when the signs went up that said, um, Trout Creek business section next exit and it was taped off because it was wasn't quite open yet. The joke in town was that the sign said Trout Creek business section just kidding and that it was it wasn't actually going to be there. So a little bit of humor but but reflective of um, how people felt at the time. So following amalgamation there was um, an effort to kind of centralize um, recreation planning and, and really pull it together. So uh, the, the newly formed municipality uh, commissioned a planner to um, plan, make a plan for recreation for the municipality. Um, and you can go online and you can read this um, recreation action plan that it was called. Um, it had a series of um, really great recommendations on all kinds of things from staffing to facilities and infrastructure um, and how things would be managed. Um, but the action plan wasn't super well received in the municipality. It was actually a very contentious um, action plan for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the big ones being that the they suggested that when it was no longer financially feasible, that the second arena, so the Trout Creek Community Center, should be repurposed into something that wasn't an ice pad or wasn't an arena. Um, and this was this recommendation was made based on the idea that there was two arenas in a very small municipality, that the other municipality, um, or the other arena rather, was closer to the larger center, could be leveraged to make more income, and that this one, in this case, could then be um, more efficiently converted into something else. However, the history of that building and that place was really, really important for the residents of that area. So not surprisingly, this led to kind of mobilization of the people in the area and um, their kind of collective action to try to save the community center and keep it the community center that they knew. So in the book chapter, we talk about this as a process of community resiliency. So responding to a significant change in the community um, and coming together, participating in this collective action in order to elicit change or grow stronger as a result of these outcomes. So what happened was there was this real kind of reinvigoration of activity around the community center. The board became very active. People in the area became very active and engaged in programming and things that were happening at the arena. And it really became a, a site of action where people were able to come together um, and assert the importance of that place for people in the community. As a result, in the following municipal elections, this became a, 
an important item or issue. Eventually the recreation action plan was kind of put to rest because it came to symbolize that one recommendation that um, the community center be shut down. The later municipal councils worked really closely with the board to establish a new kind of structure whereby they would take responsibility for any capital investments or things related to the building if the board was responsible for the programming and staffing of the building. So the board still retains control in the way that what happens and how it happens, um, but the municipality is able to support that in another way. And this led to a real engagement of people in this these activities as well. Um, there, the programming that always took place had new kind of um, thought put into it and new ideas that are really shaking things up and doing it differently. And interestingly, a lot of the things that were um, articulated in the action plan have also come around in different ways. So the arena is still alive and well with lots of programming happening, but some of the other kind of programming things that were in the recreation action plan were realized, albeit just in a different way that wasn't necessarily um, articulated in the action plan. So what does this tell us about recreation and regional development? Well, one, that we shouldn't underestimate the importance of recreation and leisure in citizens' lived experiences in their communities. These are very important spaces and places and programs for people. And because they're so immediate or they're the actual things people engage in in their day to day, they can become a, a real point that people rally around and collectively come together for. Also important to consider that recreation and leisure are inherently political. So whether it's about the spaces or the activities that happen in the spaces, um, these are political things and they can be politicized. And then they can have implications for, for the plans and the way that you hope your plans play out. It's also important to think regionally about these plans and think regionally about sport and recreation um, and what they mean for a region. So this can be difficult in smaller places, particularly where people feel very strongly about their, their places, so their facilities or their infrastructure. And these places may also be those kind of places where rivalries are felt or are held onto. But if people can come together and work together, there's a lot of possibilities um, and potential in thinking regionally about recreation. And I think if we look to the tourism literature, there's some really great examples of how regions are able to work together and, um, and plan for the long term um, with regards to sport, recreation, and tourism. And it's also important to think regionally at multiple levels. So in other research, you know, I've spoken to sport clubs where they have talked about really having to overcome those rivalries with neighborhood clubs, but in doing so, they're able to maintain a certain level of competition or engagement by combining with other clubs. So clubs in neighboring communities that don't have enough kids to feel the team, but they can combine their groups and play one season in one municipality and one season in the other, and still offer that competitive opportunity that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. When we're talking about municipals, your municipalities rather, thinking about differences within the municipality. So the different stakeholders and the different perspectives within the community and the way that these plans with regard to sport and recreation are going to be picked up or received is really, really important. So although the, we may think that decision-making happens on behalf of the, the whole municipality, often it doesn't. And often not everyone is kind of engaged in that decision-making process the way that we would like them to be. It's also important to consider the kind of higher level policy around this as well. So how provincial policy, things like amalgamation can create tensions with regard to sport and recreation, or the way that policy from, for example, national sport organizations or provincial sport organizations can have impact for sport and recreation programming at the local level. And as I'm sure you've talked about in different instances, um, the way that the planning process can be just as important as the outcomes of the plans. So here, although there was an attempt to engage community members in this kind of planning process, 
that probably wasn't as well picked up as it should have been. And as a result, the plan was made based on a rather kind of prescribed view of what um, the community wanted or needed. So there's both lots of kind of tensions or perils, but also a lot of potential in thinking about recreation from a regional perspective. Okay, so to wrap it up here, I really don't think we can underestimate the importance of sport, recreation, and leisure in people's lives, and by extension, on the planning process. These are really important things that people feel very strongly about, and it has the potential to really be transformative in terms of people's social lives and their well-being. That's really what I'm interested in in my research program, and I'm always really excited to learn about different um, examples or small communities who are doing things differently. I'm happy to chat anytime. You've got my email and my Twitter here. And I'm also actively looking for grad students to start in September 2021. So if you've considered grad school and you might like to look at sport recreation and development in some way, please reach out and let me know. I've linked some references here if you'd like some further readings. And I'm also happy to direct you to other ones if you'd like to get in touch. Thanks for your attention, and I hopefully will be able to connect with you soon.